people first organizations will win in the future of work. Your only real asset is your people. We, we all, all want purpose driven work. work. HR led organization is. I'm the sorry, but leaders don't lead empty desks and empty shop floors. Welcome to the People Strategy Leaders Show. I'm your host, Sri Chalapa, founder and president of Engagedly, and a serial entrepreneur in technology, films, and music. This is where we talk to people leaders, business strategists, and organizational savants about leading in the time of change. What is working, what is not working, and more importantly, what we should be thinking about. Stick around to the end of the show. We will reveal how you can be our next guest. And now, let's engage. Hello, and welcome back to People Strategy Leaders Podcast. Uh, we took a little break for the holidays, and now we are back. Um, today, I have Tina Robinson um, as a founder of WorkJoy and one of Engagedly's top 100 HR influencers for 2023. Tina builds on 25 years of corporate operations, technology consulting, and people leadership experience to provide innovative coaching solutions to organizations ready to unleash the potential of their humans. From personal branding to leadership development to cross-functional global training, Tina co-creates people programs that drive business outcomes and deliver human results. Tina partners with, tra with leaders from trailblazing organizations across industries, including Fabletics, actually one of my, Fablet one of my favorite brands, Fox Sports, National, Wildlife Foundation, SAP, and Spotify. Tina also is a leadership coach for the UCLA Anderson Executive MBA program. Tina is an honors graduate of University of Virginia and a University of Michigan MBA. Graduate of the Global Coactive Training Institute coaching program and a sought after national speaker. She lives in Los Angeles with her writer husband and two beloved pet parrots. There you go, Tina. It's, a, it's quite, a, quite a life you're living there. It is quite a life. Anyone crazy enough to live with birds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, being in St. Louis right now, it's really, really cold. Uh, today is a better day. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little jealous of you being in Los Angeles by the coast. Oh, well, if I could show you our weather, uh, we are being deluged right now in rain. It began last night. Um, and when Los Angeles gets rain, it's like buckets pour out of the, the, the sky. So we're going to be under rain clouds for a few days. So uh, um, you might actually have nicer weather in St. Louis right now. Probably today. Today for a change. <laughs> Today I do. Today it's nice, balmy forty-five. It's nice, beautiful. Ooh, yeah. If, as long as there's sun, that's a good thing. That's that's right. So, Tina, we're going to talk about engagement today, mm -hmm. um, and the employee engagement programs. And in our last discussion, we were discussing, and you said was broken in some ways. You know, the way organizations are doing it um, is not working. Why is that? First of all, thank you so much for having me on. Um, I was so honored and delighted to um, receive the notice last year that I was on the top 100 HR influencers list. I'm incredibly honored and grateful for that. So thank you. And it's been lovely getting to know you and your team. Um, yeah, I have been an HR leader. I have led HR functions. I have been poking at humans at work from both internal roles and external opportunities. And yeah, the way we handle engagement is broken. And one of the main measurements of that is that we look at the Gallup polls. So Gallup has been measuring engagement nationally here in the US and globally since about 2000. And the percentage of employees surveyed has ranged over the last 23 years, has ranged from about 26% engaged to a high during the pandemic of about 36%. That's it. We have yet to crack 36% and the, we got there only at a time of cataclysmic change globally related to work. So we looked at that and if we were looking at a corporate scorecard, we would say, those are really not good numbers. Right. What are we doing wrong? And yet organizations, despite that data, keep doubling down on efforts that aren't serving them. Yeah, isn't that the definition of insanity as Einstein would have put it? So what is it that organizations are doing or not doing that's driving these suboptimal results? It's a great question. 
um, from what I have seen, and I, I don't, I'm going to generalize here because I know there are many organizations and probably many listeners of this podcast who are going to raise their hands and go, well, we're doing something different. And I applaud you for that. What many organizations do is they use big programs to solve the engagement problem when engagement is in a very, very personal experience. And so we're using big impersonal programs, big impersonal initiatives to address an extremely personal challenge. And you're going to get this misfit. So give me an example of a big person, impersonal program that you often see in your experience. Great. Um, and I'm sure listeners are going to chime in with, oh, you know, we've done that or here's some ideas. Um, social things going well. Engagement is, um, is about bringing people together. So we're going to have a summer picnic. We're going to have a holiday party and we're going to have more opportunities for people to come together socially. Now, that's an outlay of money. It's an outlay of time. I've led HR functions. I've been responsible for having to organize those. A lot of time and effort and funding goes into doing those right. They feel like they're, there are things that are going to make everybody happy. But you have plenty of people who would rather be anywhere than a summer picnic. Yeah. They would much rather be told, oh, really? Can we just close the office at noon and I can go home? I have two kids at home or my husband travels and I never see him or um, I want to go walk my dogs. They don't want to go to a summer picnic. That's not going to light them up and motivate them. Um, or, hey, we're going to have a holiday party where it's going to be an open bar and jello shooters and the, you know this amazing winter wonderland. And people go, I don't drink. I don't want to go to a holiday party on the weekend or at night. That's not going to light me up and motivate me. So the organization takes a chance on these big initiatives that they're going to motivate people, that they're going to spark engagement. And there might be a short-term blip, but probably not if they measured engagement before and after. So some of these large programs or initiatives like, like a summer picnic or a getaway, a weekend getaway or something like that, because we've done that in our organization as well. And people actually enjoy it in our case uh, because yeah. we have a lot of, we have a pretty young group, our average age in our company is like, mid to late 20s um, mm -hmm. and so it's it's a different situation for them than somebody who's got two kids at home and they don't want to and they're like the weekend is the only time I get to spend quality time with my family and my kids and whatnot so obviously there are different you know aspects that might drive that Great um, point. but, but are, are there are there specific initiatives that can be done at scale because um, the reason i'm asking that is obviously if you have like let's say an organization of you know a few thousand people i mean it is going to be hard to get personal unless you empower the managers at levels you know one or two down to do something at a personal level and not every manager is trained or equipped to do that you know they're not they're, they're not it's not something they the skill they learned um how would you like how would you help a company that's got over, a, you know, let's say a few thousand people, three, 4,000 people or more. I love what you just said. So let me go back to your point about, hey, we have a pretty young population. You're right. Demographics absolutely play into it. Um, if you have a younger employee population, oftentimes more people will see work as a social outlet they will want to make friends at work. Work becomes part of their social community. Um, they'll stick around for a happy hour at work on a Thursday. Um, they want to go out to lunch with um, new friends that they've made on their, their teams. And I'm not saying that there aren't young people who don't want that. And I'm not saying that there aren't more mature professionals who also love that. So again, we're, we're talking in sort of broad swaths, but I'm so glad that you raised that. And I also love what you said is, what can we do at scale? And then you went to training managers to have engagement conversations. And I think that can absolutely be done at scale. 
put the same level of effort and time and money in uh, that you may put into a bunch of parties into tr teaching your managers how to have one-on-one -on -one engagement conversations. So that becomes a development initiative done at scale. Ideally, you're building in some accountability measurements into that, but you're teaching managers how to have one-on-one -on -one engagement conversations with the people on their teams to find out what lights you up, what motivates you, what mm -hmm. makes you happy at work. So I think I love the, the way that you combined something that feels very personal with something that absolutely could be done at scale. Yeah. You know, when we look at engagement surveys and we have a platform that does engagement surveys and mm -hmm. you can see the results and it, it's very evident. Usually there's a problem department or a problem group, whether it's a location or whether it's a specific function, or maybe it's a few managers, you can get down to that level depending on how big a cohort of people you're running engagement survey on. And it's not like the company is doing anything different for different departments. They have the same approach to you know, learning and development for the most part or uh, rewards and recognition or other types of engagement driving activities, if you will. Mm -hmm. So engagement is, and I agree with you, um, to reiterate you, is at a more personal level where you could give them happy hours and ping pong tables or... Um, you know, a budget for learning and development. But if the manager's behaviors are not aligned with what drives people's engagement, that's going to still be a problem. And no amount of throwing money at that problem is going to solve that. You basically need to train your managers. Would you agree with that assertion? I would. And it's not just me saying that. It's not just you saying that. Um, again, to go back to our friends at Gallup, um, they've done research that shows that up to 70% of the difference in engagement team over team can be attributed to the managers. Now, you and I, and I, I don't want to speak for you, but um, we would probably say, you know, look, it's not the manager's responsibility to engage their employees. This is a partnership. So employees have to own their piece of engagement. And then managers have to recognize that, that they do have tremendous influence on the engagement of their team members. So I would agree with you. Um, the managers play a critical role. And oftentimes organizations want to almost like abdicate them of any kind of responsibility or any kind of influence, not train them, and then just put in large programs that sort of take the manager out of it. Yeah. So let's talk about that for, a, 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 you know, touch upon that a little bit more. The um, managers, you know, they are, managers are one of the toughest jobs, to be honest, Espe especially if you're a, a new manager, you know, you're thrown into this, um, you know, ring to go and start fighting because you, you just got, uh, a really great review and you did a great job in your role and I'm like oh guess what you're promoted now you're a manager Let's promote you and 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 they get promoted because of the work products and deliverables and the activity they did not necessarily always because they are a best equipped to do people management right so they have to obviously get good at that over mm -hmm. time and, and, and quick, as quickly as possible I talk about the lab in, in a lot about that in my own LinkedIn posts and my own in my in my other um, you know discourse on this topic. Mm -hmm. But where I'm going with this is that managers are in a tough position because they're getting pressure from their employees, from their people they're managing, and they're also getting pressure from their directors and the VPs and the executives at the top. So they're getting squeezed in the middle. So what type of training would you recommend and or or when I say training, I don't necessarily mean like send them to a classroom, but mentoring, coaching, other types of experiential training, you know, things like that. What do you recommend that we do for managers so they can be better managers who are and not just in performance, but engaging managers? Yeah. And I'm so glad that you talk about this. And I'm 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 delighted that you're putting your voice out there because you're right. Um, managers get squeezed top down because they have to be managing up and it's they they have responsibilities to the larger organization. They get squeezed from the side. 
um, from their peers because they have to start developing breath and cross-functional perspective. And they get squeezed from the bottom with the demands and the expectations and the needs of the people that they're leading. So you almost imagine this manager box that has this constant pressure on it. Um, it's one of the reasons 360s exist because it looks at how people at who are above to the side and below you perceive you. Um, I agree. Training is not the answer. Um, and I, I'm a teacher. I'm a trainer. I've taught in colleges. I facilitate. I do not believe in the let's put managers in a four hour class and bloop, 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 you know, our problem is solved. We, we all know that that's not the case. Um, I do think it's about giving managers a simple framework and some sample questions to jumpstart conversations. It's teaching them how to ask questions. It's teaching them how to listen actively. It's teaching them how to ask follow-up questions. And then it's holding them accountable for having those conversations. I've been in the humans at work space my entire career. I can count on one hand the number of times my own leaders have had those conversations with me. And we're supposed to be the ones in organizations that are role modeling this. So hmm. um, manage, you're exactly right. Managers do not come into management roles knowing how to do this. They need to be coached. They need to be taught. They need to have those new skills reinforced. They need to be celebrated for when they do it. Um, and managers are smart. Most of them learn how to do this. Yeah. And, and they need space for that. You know, yes. they can be th thrust into, you know, five alarm fire and say, go and fight the battle without being having without being given the time and space to develop and the tools. skills and the tools to do that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's talk about more personal, you know, so engagement is more personal. You know, some people prefer uh, and, and this has been proven in the, at least in the rewards and recognition space, you know, some people prefer a gift card, some people prefer a getaway, weekend getaway, some people prefer just a day off, you know, and or some people prefer a recognition and a medal and the podium. There, there are ways people like to be recognized and rewarded, you know, mm -hmm. so obviously that's true for engagement as well, where some, mm -hmm. some, the way people feel engaged, you know, some people feel engaged when they are given a budget and time for their own pet projects that they want to work on, you know, which is something that Google had done and obviously famously, uh, you know, 3M used to do and things like that. Then there are some people who prefer, who feel more engaged when they feel like they're being heard, they have a voice in the decision-making process and things of this nature. Some people feel engaged when they, when they are given more challenging projects, you know, and some people engage, feel more engaged when they when they feel like they are part of a fun group, right? They work with. So that's the challenge. Is as a as a manager, you really need to have that emotional intelligence, uh, I believe, to be that personal. Can you talk a little bit more about that? On what what personal means in your context? Because you talk about that in your own uh, you know thought thought leadership there. Absolutely. And I have spoken about this at conferences. I've written about this on LinkedIn. Um, there is a book in my head that I'm going to write about this. Um, I've taught managers how to do this. I've coached managers on, on how to do this. I'm an external coach. I'm a facilitator, all of it. Um, what you are getting at is that humans have needs and desires. We want and need different things from work. And so you just listed off a really good um, starting point. We, need, we want certain levels of compensation. We want certain levels of autonomy, certain levels of flexibility, certain levels of challenge, certain levels of social interaction, certain opportunities for growth, certain qualities in our managers, certain qualities in the people that we engage with somebody, one of my clients recently said, I want a level of intellectual rigor in my colleagues and peers. We want a certain sense of purpose and vision. We want to work in certain industries. We want to do day to day certain kinds of work. We want and need as human creatures, certain things from work. And that is the starting point of engagement.
is having the confidence as individual employees to ask for what we need. And then as a manager, having the courage and confidence to ask your employees, what do you want from work? Now, interestingly, we do this in the interview process, Mm -hmm. right? We go into an interview having a sort of a list in our head of what we want and need from work, our must-haves and our nice-to-haves. I, you know, I want to have this level of calm. I want this. I want this. And then somehow that goes away. We get the job and then it's not like our list of wants and needs goes away. It's just that everybody stops talking about it. And I, and part of my mission is to coach managers and employees to say, keep that conversation alive because your wants and needs are going to evolve. Mm -hmm. As you evolve in your profession, if you had asked me what I wanted and needed from work 25 years ago, it'd be a very different list than what I need and want from work today. Yeah, yeah. No, that's absolutely true. You know, and I look back at my career, what I wanted in my 20s, I wanted a challenging work where I worked seven days a week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I I didn't care if I had a Sunday off or not. I worked, I remember working through Thanksgiving, um, obviously. I didn't have a big family here or anything, so it it didn't matter as much for me at that point. Um, but it's not it's not the same for everyone, obviously, because mm-hmm. I want I was very aggressively ambitious and I wanted to climb up the corporate ladder. You know, when I did work for a large corporation back in the day, and I wanted hard assignments. I wanted assignments that were a good two, three, four years more experienced person would have, and and um, learn from that. As I got older, I wanted a little bit more flexibility. I wanted to have my some of my evenings back and my weekends to travel. Um, you know, and what I want now obviously is very different because I'm the CEO. I can basically define what I want to do, but it doesn't necessarily serve the purpose of the organization. So I end up working more than I should, and I think about work almost pretty much every waking hour. Um, so, um, so anyway, it does it does evolve over time, and as your family situation changes you know you might you might have a a, um, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or you might get married and you might have kids and all those things can drive that uh, and some people want to pursue additional hobbies you know they want to spend time maybe learning music or paint or whatever that is so those are things that need to consideration so i think what i'm getting to is that having these c- continuous conversations is important um in the from a manager's point of view or from a leadership perspective depending on um, you know what your role is in the in the in that space. Now I'm going to actually flip this a little bit um, from an employee's perspective. How do they work? How should they be communicating with their management and their peers so that they can be more engaged? Because nobody really wants to be disengaged, to be honest, right? Nobody really wants a job. Say, I want a job that I'm disengaged at. Nobody <laughs> goes that goes into a work with that mission. It just happens. So, how, and it's not helpful to them either. You know, it's not. It's it's it is uh, frustrating for them to be in a job they don't love or they don't or or a, or a workplace they don't they don't connect with. What is their onus in this whole situation? Such a great question. And I have this image of a teacher asking a little six year old, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the person goes, I want to be disengaged with one foot out the door. Yeah. Hopefully we don't have a lot of six year olds saying that. Um, But yeah, you know, when you're six, you're going, I want to be a firefighter or an astronaut or I want to, you know, be an actor. You know, you have these aspirational visions of work. You know, your your inner child is screaming out. I want a job that's fun. I want a job that lights me up. I want a job that I want to brag about. I want a job that makes me look forward to Mondays that doesn't even feel like a job. Your inner child wants that. Mm-hmm. Your inner child yeah. did not say, I'd really like to be, you know, in middle management in a cube, you know, praying for the weekend and living for holidays. And working just enough so I don't get fired. <laughs> and working just enough so I don't get fired. Right. Um because no, I've heard that many times from my friends before. And I'm like, okay, you probably need to do something different in life then. 
Well, I mean, it is, and you're right, you know, and, and I think all of us, if you ask any professional, especially professionals who've been in, in the workspace for a while, we've all felt disengagement. We've all been there. Yep. And you're right. It feels really icky. I don't like feeling like that. And yet I have been in that situation and I'm also self-aware and I've done a lot of work with myself because I'm a coach and teacher and help other people to recognize when I'm moving there and to do something about it. And that's the self-responsibility that I think we also need to hire for, but also encourage in our employees is, you know, to own it, to own your engagement. And so to have regular conversations with your manager about what you want and need from work. And we could have a whole other podcast about psychological safety. Yeah. which is this, you know, many people, many listeners probably know what it is. For those who don't, um, it's been shown by research to be a number one driver of team performance. And it's this environment in which people feel safe to express their needs, to ask questions, to challenge, to disagree, to speak up. Now, it's really hard for an individual to come forward with their needs and desires and wants in an environment that isn't psychologically safe. So it becomes this sort of cycle of the safer we make our employees feel as leaders to have these open conversations, the more we open the door to these conversations, the more we ask these questions, the more our employees feel safe to ask us. One of the hardest things for a manager is when one of their star employees comes to them and says, yeah, I've taken another job. And I'm sure you've seen this, you know, oh, yeah. and you felt this. And these leaders go, oh, how did I not see this coming? Why didn't you come to me? Why haven't we talked about this? And oftentimes, the difference between that job and the new job is like this and could have been addressed in some of those wants and needs conversations. And yet, for whatever reason, the conversation didn't happen. I actually wrote about this for Talent Development Magazine. Um, giving a little fake scenario about this that unfortunately is based in reality of if only we had talked about this, you wanted something that we absolutely could have given you in this job. Well, you never asked me. Well, I didn't feel safe asking for it. Yeah. And they won't say that. That's the hard part. So since they won't say it, even when they're leaving, they will not say it. Uh, right. I've noticed that too. And, and not in my team, fortunately, but I've noticed that. How could they leave you? Even, you're even, you're fabulous. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll take that as a compliment. But uh, yes. um, the um, you know, when the, the, so the problem is, so then the managers still don't know why they left. They thought, oh, they left because they went to this company that's got a bigger brand, or they got twenty percent more money, or whatever the thing is. And mm -hmm. but that's not the real reason. You know, it, the real reason is they didn't feel connected because they didn't feel psychologically safe, as you said or they're working on something really mundane and they didn't feel safe enough to say that I really don't like what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And Somehow a need was not being met, whatever that need was. And you're exactly right. And managers start to guess and make assumptions that aren't necessarily based in truth and reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I want to touch on one topic uh, in, in to prevent such things. A lot of organizations do stay interviewed, right? Mm -hmm. um, what, tell me a little bit about What's the purpose of a stay interview? Who, when should you do it? What is the format? I mean, talk a little, little bit on structure around that. Oh, I love me a good stay interview. So the concept of a stay interview sort of harkens back to something that we talked about earlier is that we have these conversations in the interview process. What do you want from work? And how can we as an organization deliver that to you? Um, as an organization, here's what we need from you what do you have to offer? And yet we onboard somebody and then we never have that conversation again. Mm -hmm. And then we wonder why they leave or we wonder why they become disengaged. The concept of a stay conversation is to use a simple framework that, I'll, that I will walk through um, to keep that conversation alive. And so here's the framework, really simple two by two. In business, I think many of us realize all world problems can be solved with a two by two matrix. So I, 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 use, as, you know, I use that a lot all the time. Oh, I love me a good two by two matrix. So um, 
we as humans, we need certain things from work. And we just went through that list, you know, certain qualities in our leaders, certain um, aspects to our job, certain levels of comp, certain levels of flexibility, all of that. You can make a long list, what we need and want from work. In exchange for an organization meeting those needs, we are willing to offer something. I am willing to offer my experience, my expertise, my skills, my drive, my willingness to learn, my willingness to adapt to the culture, my all of the things that make me me are part of my offer. And that's what I'm willing to offer in exchange to the organization meeting my needs. But I want my offer to be valued, recognized, and rewarded. That's also something that I want and need. On the other side, the organization needs things from me. And in exchange for that, the organization is willing to meet my needs. They're willing to give me certain levels of comp, certain levels of flexibility, paid time off, all these other things. The engagement magic happens when what I am able and willing to offer is needed by the organization and valued and rewarded. And when what the organization needs from me, I'm able to offer. So yes. my needs are met, the organization's needs are met, and our mutual offer are respected and valued. It's a two by two matrix. And in a framework that I have that I'm happy to share with your viewers, I'm happy to share. Um, I can also put a link to the article that I, I've written about this. Um, there are questions you can ask in each of those boxes um, to jumpstart a state conversation. We're talking like four or five, six questions, that's it. And then use your active listening, follow up, and then do something with the information and even more importantly, continue having that conversation. Because again, research has shown that another part of engagement is regular, meaningful conversations between employees and managers. Not just, what have you done for me lately? How are you meeting your goals checklist? But meaningful conversations that get to some of these things that make us uniquely human. So how often should, okay, well, two questions. Is a stay conversation an actual conversation and does it have to be an actual conversation or can it be a survey that the organization runs at scale again, right? Mm. Or does it need to be a combination of the two? Um, what's your framework that you typically recommend? Um, obviously easier to do all of these when you're a smaller company, but when you get to five, 10, 15,000 people asking every manager to do it and then following up, did you do it? Did you do it? Did you do it? You know, cause then you have like, you know, six, 700,000 managers, you know, that could be a problem too. But I want to understand your, how you actually would go about implementing it as a CEO. Great question. And you're already making me think about the inter the intersection of a large scale engagement survey with the smaller scale stake conversation. I do think there are elements of a stake conversation that you could ask at scale. Things like what offers, what organizational offers or benefits do employees care about the most? I mean, think about the changing nature of work. All of us who have been in this space our entire careers we have been blown away by what has gone on since 2020 in workplaces and continues to reverberate. Um, so asking people for, based on what the organization is offering today and what we could offer, what do you need the most? What do you want the most? You know, study after study shows that employees for the most part want hybrid. They want flexibility. They want autonomy. I just read an article about my former employer, I, uh, one of my former employers. Again, there's um, an uproar from employees because they're being told to go back in the office. So what? So you can ask at scale on an engagement survey elements of what do you value from our offering, from what we give you, and then Maybe look at your organizational offering to, to make that more appealing to more broad swaths of employees. I, I don't think that it's impossible to require employee to, to require managers to have these conversations because accountability 
is layer by layer. So let's say you have 10,000 employees. Well, you're asking each level of leadership to hold their small group of managers accountable. Mm -hmm. And the accountability just builds. And so, especially if you have, if leaders are role modeling this for the managers who report to them, and if they're having, so if you're a director and you're having these conversations with your managers, and I think that's a big gap that we have right now is that, and I just read about this on LinkedIn, is that not all leaders see themselves as role models too, and how you have to demonstrate and put out there what you want to get back. So I don't think, think it's impossible to get the majority of managers having these conversations. It just takes commitment, skill building, and role modeling, and now, an accountability mechanism. Now, does this stay conversation is different than your regular one-on-ones, right? It's doesn't different. Have to be. Than, doesn't have to be. Okay. No, and I think they how, can be how often should it be? happening. I'm, I'm wondering if, because you know, one-on-one, you're talking about your work and you're like, what did you accomplish? How can I help you accomplish your projects? Things of this nature. And is it, do you mix the two or do you need to separate a bucket of time, a block of time and say this today, every once a quarter, once every six months or whatever the time frame that you would recommend, we're going to spend 30 minutes just talking about your psychological, emotional needs and your career needs from work. And, you know, which is basically a quote unquote, stay interview or stay mm -hmm. conversation? Great question. And, and I love that you're talking about for our audience today, operationalizing this and making this real because it's all lovely when it's in theory. And I, and I'm an operator too. I love helping execute stuff that's in the clouds. Um, this should not be a once a year conversation because a lot happens in a year. I think once managers have the fluency in the framework and asking these questions, they can seamlessly weave one or two questions into every one-on-one -on -one without making the one-on-one -on -one feel like a formal stay conversation. And then maybe quarterly, it's a little bit more, ro more robust. You know, so maybe quarterly, because quarter, you know, so often organizations have quarterly objectives, maybe it's a little bit more uh, structured. But I think if you can ask a lot of these questions in very subtle ways, in very natural ways, one or two at a time in every conversation that you have, maybe it's a biweekly with your employee and even asking something like, you know, hey, um, how are we optimizing your, your skills or what projects would you like to get involved in? Or, hey, how are you feeling about this program that you're working on? All mm -hmm. of those are getting into needs and offers. They're just, without making it feel prescriptive, like a manager has a checklist and going, okay, hi, Tina, let's start asking you. So I think one-off, two-off questions built into every conversation, a little bit more robust in maybe quarterly conversations um, as these managers build their fluency and build this language and develop this confidence. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I think uh, the challenge will be to make sure that the managers are trained to ask these in a way that's conversational rather than uh, more uh, or inter like interrogative in nature. Right. Or more robotic of like, I I am, how are we optimizing your offer, Shri? And they're looking, you know, they're looking at this, they're going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come on. And then they Be offer, what offer? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, but if somebody said to me, you know, hey, um, how am I showing up for you as a leader? You know, what are some things that you need from me that maybe I, that I could, I could deliver more? Yeah. Whew. I mean, if I had a boss, especially early in my career, who asked me that and really wanted to know the answer. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they're just they're doing it because they really care and not because they're checking the box like, oh, I'm supposed to do this every quarter. So let me check the box here, you know. Yeah. So 
Well, Tina, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I know we've unfortunately run out of time. I could sit and talk about the subject all day long because it is one of my favorite subjects around manager effectiveness um, and building great managers from day one. I think some of those topics are uh, near and dear to me because that's what ultimately scales your organization is having great managers. Um, you, can, you can have a great CEO, you can have a great VP, but until you have great managers, you can be successful as an organization. So... I, it's, it's an important subject um, and that's where engagement becomes very personal so well thanks Tina it's been a pleasure um, we should you. probably have another deeper discussion on on some of these related subjects given your expertise in different areas around manager coaching and manager effectiveness you know that's probably another longer discussion to be had thank you well, again. thank you so much for this opportunity um, it was such a thrill and I just appreciate the work that you and your team are doing because um, you are helping or you're helping organizations get better at this too um, so really I'm grateful for that thank you until next time Sri Chalapa here thank you so much for listening to the People Strategy Leaders podcast if you are a successful leader or a people strategist who would like to be on this program please visit engagedly.com slash people strategy leaders podcast. If you got something out of this interview, would you share this episode on social media? If you know someone that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag people strategy leaders. I love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content to make sure you don't miss any episodes. Go ahead and subscribe your thumbs up ratings and reviews go a long way to help promote the show and mean a lot to me and my team want to know more follow me on linkedin and twitter at sri chalapa thanks for listening we will see you next time and thank you to patrick ramsey sound engineer at kalinga production studios for recording and mixing this show